ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Just to make sure everybody's in the right place, for those of you who thought that this was a public hearing on the Kosciuszko Bridge, <laughs> that will be taking place at the DOT headquarters. This is also not about the Kosciuszko Twin Bridges north of Albany, New York. And this is not about Kosciuszko, Mississippi, <laughs> birthplace of the lovely Oprah Winfrey. Some of you may have heard of Kosciuszko County, Indiana, or the one of many other statues and places in America that, Kosciuszko, that are named after Kosciuszko. And those of you who thought that this would be a discussion about Kosciuszko mustard, <laughs> that discussion takes place at your local deli every day. No, this is about Thaddeus Kosciuszko, the peasant prince, Thaddeus Kosciuszko in the Age of Revolution. Kosciuszko was a prince of tolerance who stood up for the disenfranchised of all races, religions, and genders. He was probably the greatest humanitarian of his era. In 1817, when the news of his death and exile in Switzerland spread throughout Europe, funeral masses were held in Catholic, Lutheran, and Calvinist churches. Even Jewish temples and Muslim mosques held services where the worshipers prayed for, the, for God to take Kosciuszko's soul to heaven. Think about it. Europe had gone through decades of ethnic and religious strife, yet everybody prayed for his soul. Kosciuszko was born in feudalistic Europe at a time where the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth spanned from the Black Sea all the way to the Baltic. Kosciuszko's family had a modest estate, and under feudalism, if you owned land, you owned the people that were on that land. So his family owned 31 peasant families that tilled the fields that belonged to his family. In feudalism, the families that owned these slaves, these slaves worked from day until night. But Poland had a form of democracy where the kings were elected, and their king at the time of Kosciuszko's birth was Stanisław Augustus. And he was elected thanks to the help of his lover, Catherine the Great of Russia. Now, Russia started having more and more of an impact in Polish society at this time, so a lot of Poles were trying to figure out ways to help drive out the Russians. One of them was Prince Adam Kazimierz Czartoryski, who we see here. Czartoryski caught the attention, uh, Kosciuszko caught the attention of Prince Czartoryski, who was at the time starting a new night school, a royal night school, to create a class of soldiers that would help drive out the Russians. And Kosciuszko caught his attention because he was brilliant in math and art. In fact, Kosciuszko did this drawing of the prince. Now, after graduating from the Royal Knight School, which today is the administration building of the University of Warsaw, Kosciuszko became a captain of the artillery. And during this time, some of the families, the royal the families in Poland, decided that they wanted to get rid of the Russians even faster. So a civil war broke out. And in that civil war, Kazimierz Pulaski, who was from one of the families who you may have heard of, also served in the American Revolution, led the civil war to drive out the Russians. Kosciuszko had a, had a choice to make. Do I join with Kazimir Pulaski and help drive out the Russians and go against the king and the prince who paid for my studies? Either way, he would be killing Poles. So he decided not to take sides, and instead, he took advantage of a scholarship to go to France and study art, and on the side, he studied military engineering. Because he couldn't go to the military school in Paris because he wasn't a French citizen, he audited those classes and learned about all of the theories about Vauban and others who created these incredible military strategies. And while he was there, he did these paintings. This is one of them. And here's another palace that he, des he designed that was meant for Prince Czartoryski. But in Paris, Kosciuszko also became obsessed with a new philosophy, an economic philosophy, called physiocracy. And under physiocracy, Francois Canet and those who started it had a theory that all wealth comes from the land. And those who own the land are the richest. But why are they the richest? They are the richest because the serfs, the peasants, farm that land and make it more valuable. So he came up with this philosophy, laissez-faire, hands off the serfs, and give them more of the fruits of their labor so that they'll be happier and they'll produce more. Well, Kosciuszko absolutely fell in love with this theory because it had a lot of implications for Poland, because the peasants were also slaves in Poland. So when he returned to Poland, 
he couldn't get a job in the military, so he took a job tutoring the daughters of one of the richest men in Poland, Lord Sosnowski. Lord Sosnowski had a daughter named Louise. And Kostiuszko started tutoring Louise and explaining to her all about physiocracy. And she said, Psh, don't tell me about physiocracy. Because when you were in Paris making nice drawings, me and my sister translated the first book from French into Polish on physiocracy. That was it. Kostiuszko fell madly in love with her. <laughs> and he decided that he wanted to marry her. So he went to Lord Sosnowski and he said, I would like to marry your daughter. Well, Lord Sosnowski looked at uh, Kostiuszko's estate, realized he didn't have that much money, and he said, I'm very sorry, but pigeons are not meant for sparrows, and daughters of land magnets are not meant for the sons of the common gentry. So Kostiuszko tried to elope with Ludwiga. Unfortunately, he was captured, and he pulled out his sword, and he was about to fight off Lord Sosnowski and his men, and he realized that this is the father of the woman that I'm in love with. So he put his sword back into his sheath, and they beat him up, knocked him unconscious, and they took the daughter away. Now, Kostiuszko later had to run away because after this, the father decided that he's going to try and prosecute him for abducting his daughter. So Kostiuszko left, went to Paris, where he learned about the American Revolution, first heard about the, uh, the battles of Lexington and Concord, so there, he set sail for America. And after crossing the Atlantic in hurricane season, where his boat was shipwrecked in the Caribbean, and he had to swim to shore with the mast because the boat fell apart, eventually he made his way to Philadelphia. And when he got to Philadelphia, he went and introduced himself <coughs> to the only American he had ever heard of, Benjamin Franklin. And he walked into Ben Franklin's office and he said, I'd like to take your test for military engineering. And Ben Franklin looked at him like he was from Mars and said, we're a country of farmers and merchants and we don't have an army, much less a test for, what is it, military engineering? But we do have somebody who knows a lot about geometry. Come back, we'll give you a geometry test. Kostiuszko came back, he took the geometry test and he aced it. And Ben Franklin said, you're in charge of building forts. So he built forts across the river, the Delaware River, from Philadelphia at Forts Mercer and Billingsport. And while, while he was building these forts, they realized that the British ships would sail into the Delaware <clears throat> and try to bombard Philadelphia. So he started building what's known as a chevaux de fris. These were basically wooden spikes of tree trunks that were shaved down, and they would put iron tips on the end. And then they would put these underwater so that when the British ships would sail in, they would puncture the bottom of the ship, and then they would sink. The Americans said, this guy knows what he's doing. So they made him a colonel of the engineers, and they paid him a reward. And Ben Franklin went off to Paris, and suddenly there was a battle for who would, who would Kostiuszko work for next. Well, he got the attention of General Horatio Gates, who was the commander of the Northern Army for the Continental Army. And General Gates, was in charge of New York, and he knew that the British would be coming down from Canada and attacking from three sides. So he sent Kostiuszko up here to a place called Fort Ticonderoga and said, figure out if this fort is secure and if it's some place that we can, we can make our stand. So Kostiuszko got up to Fort Ticonderoga and said, you have this fantastic fort here, but you have this hill. And if the British come down and put cannons on that hill, they can shoot into the fort. Well, the Americans didn't listen to him because they said, how are we going to get cannons up this steep hill? And so they, they didn't do it. Well, the British came down. General Burgoyne's army came down. And sure enough, General Phillips, who was with him, said, let's get, let's get a cannon up there. The British soldiers also whined. And General Phillips said, listen, where a goat can go, a man can go. And where a man can go, he can haul up a gun. So bring some cannons up there. Well, the next day, the Americans woke up and they saw these little red coats dancing up here, shooting cannonballs into the water. And when they started landing into the fort, they realized we have to evacuate because we're dead ducks. So they marched down the Hudson trying to run away, and they put Kostiuszko in charge of covering the rear. 